Part One of On Reading the Bible. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. On Reading the Bible by Arthur Quiller Couch. Part One. One. Read not to contradict and confute, says Bacon, of studies in general and you may be the better disposed gentlemen to forgive my choice of subject to-day if in my first sentence i rule that way of reading the bible completely out of court you may say at once that the bible being so full of doctrine as it is and such a storehouse for exegesis as it has been this is more easily said than profitably done you may grant me that the scriptures in our authorized version are part and parcel of english literature and more than part and parcel you may grant that a professor of english literature has therefore a claim if not an obligation to speak of them in that version you may having granted my incessant refusal to disconnect our national literature from our national life or to view them as disconnected accept the conclusion which plainly flows from it that no teacher of english can pardonably neglect what is at once the most majestic thing in our literature and by all odds the most spiritually living thing we inherit in our courts at once superb monument and superabundant fountain of life and yet you may discount beforehand what he must attempt for say you if he attempt the doctrine he goes straight down to buffeted waters so broad that only stout theologians can win to shore if on the other hand he ignore doctrine the play is hamlet with the prince of denmark left out he reduces our bible to mere literature to something bellatristic pretty an artifice a flimsy a gutted thing two now of all ways of dealing with literature that happens to be the way we should least admire by that way we dissociate literature from life what they said from the men who said it and meant it not seldom at the risk of their lives my pupils will bear witness in their memories that when we talk together concerning poetry for example by poetry we mean that which the poets wrote or if you like the stuff the poets wrote and their intelligence tells them of course that any one who in the simple proposition poets wrote poetry connects an object with a subject by a verb does not at any rate intend to sunder what he has just been at pains however slight to join together he may at least have the credit whether he be right or wrong of asserting his subject and his object to be interdependent take a particular proposition john milton wrote a poem called paradise lost you will hardly contest the truth of that but what does it mean milton wrote the story of the fall of man he told it in some thousands of lines of decasyllabic verse unrhymed he measured those lines out with exquisite cadences the object of our simple sentence includes all these and this much beside that he wrote the total poem and made it what it is nor can that object be fully understood literature being ever and always so personal a thing until we understand the subject john milton what manner of man he was and how on earth being such a man he contrived to do it we shall never quite know that but it is important we should get as near as we can of the bible this is yet more evident it being a translation isaiah did not write the cadences of his prophecies as we ordinary men of this country know them christ did not speak the cadences of the parables or of the sermon on the mount as we know them these have been supplied by the translators by all means let us study them and learn to delight in them but christ did not suffer for his cadences still less for the cadences invented by englishmen almost sixteen hundred years later an englishman who went to the stake did not die for these cadences 
they were lollards and reformers who lived too soon to have heard them they were catholics of the old profession who had either never heard or having heard abhorred them these men were cheerful to die for the meaning of the word and for its authorship because it was spoken by christ three there is in fact gentlemen no such thing as mere literature pedants have coined that contemptuous term to express a figmentary concept of their own imagination or to be more accurate an hallucination of wrath having about as much likeness to a vera causa as had the doll which if you remember maggie tulliver used to beat in the garret whenever poor child the world went wrong with her somehow the thoughts actions and passions of men became literature by the simple but difficult process of being recorded in memorable speech but in that process neither the real thing recorded nor the author is evacuated belletra fine art are odious terms for which no clean-thinking man has any use there is no such thing in the world as belletra if there were it would deserve the name as for fine art the late professor butcher bequeathed to us a translation of aristotle's poetics with some admirable appendixes the whole entitled aristotle's theory of poetry and fine art aristotle never in his life had a theory of fine art as distinct from other art nor i wager can you find in his discovered works a word for any such thing now if aristotle had a concept of fine art as distinguished from other art he was man enough to find a name for it his omission to do anything of the sort speaks for itself so you should beware of any teacher who would treat the bible or any part of it as fine writing mere literature four let me having said this at once enter a caveat a qualification although men do not go to the stake for the cadences the phrases of our authorized version it remains true that these cadences these phrases have for three hundred years exercised a most powerful effect upon their emotions they do so by association of ideas by the accreted memories of our race in wrapping connotation around a word a name say the name jerusalem or the name zion and they that wasted us required of us mirth saying sing us one of the songs of zion how shall we sing the lord's song in a strange land if i forget thee o jerusalem let my right hand forget her coming it must be known to you gentlemen that these words can affect men to tears who never connect them in thought with the actual geographical jerusalem who connect it in thought merely with a quite different native home from which they are exiles here and there some one man may feel a similar emotion over landor's tanagra i think not i forget but the word jerusalem will strike twenty men twentyfold more poignantly for to each it names the city familiar in spirit to his parents when they knelt and to their fathers before them not only the city which was his nursery and yet lay just beyond the landscape seen from its window its connotation includes not only what the word rome has meant and ever must mean to thousands on thousands setting eyes for the first time on the city but it holds too some hint of the new jerusalem the city of twelve gates before the vision of which st john fell prone ah my sweet home jerusalem would god i were in thee thy garden and thy gallant walks continually are green there grow such sweet and pleasant flowers as nowhere else are seen quite through the streets with pleasant sound the flood of life doth flow upon whose bank on every side the wood of life doth grow our lady sings magnificat with tones surpassing sweet and all the virgins bear their part sitting about her feet jerusalem my happy home would god i were in thee would god my woes were at an end thy joys that i might see you cannot i say 
get away from these connotations accreted through your own memories and your father's as neither can you be sure of getting free of any great literature in any tongue once it has been written let me quote you a passage from cardinal newman he is addressing the undergraduates of the catholic university of dublin how real a creation how sui generis is the style of shakespeare or of the protestant bible and the prayer book or of swift or of pope or of gibbon or of johnson i pause to mark how just this man can be to his great enemies pope was a roman catholic you will remember but gibbon was an infidel even were the subject matter without meaning though in truth the style cannot really be abstracted from the sense still the style would on that supposition remain as perfect and original a work as euclid's elements or a symphony of beethoven and like music it has seized upon the public mind and the literature of england is no longer a mere letter printed in books and shut up in libraries but it is a living voice which has gone forth in its expression and its sentiments into the world of men which daily thrills upon our ears and syllables our thoughts which speaks to us through our correspondence and dictates when we put pen to paper whether we will or no the phraseology of shakespeare of the protestant formularies of milton of pope of johnson's table talk and of walter scott have become a portion of the vernacular tongue the household words of which perhaps we little guess the origin and the very idioms of our familiar conversation so tyrannous is the literature of a nation it is too much for us we cannot destroy or reverse it we cannot make it over again it is a great work of man when it is no work of god's we cannot undo the past english literature will ever have been protestant five i am speaking then to hearers who would read not to contradict and confute who have an inherited sense of the english bible and who have even as i a store of associated ideas to be evoked by any chance phrase from it beyond this it may be nothing that can be called scholarship by any stretch of the term very well then my first piece of advice on reading the bible is that you do it i have of course no reason at all to suppose or suggest that any member of this present audience omits to do it but some general observations are permitted to an occupant of this chair and speaking generally and as one not constitutionally disposed to lamentation in the book we are discussing for example i find jeremiah the contributor least to my mind i do believe that the young read the bible less and enjoy it less probably read it less because they enjoy it less than their fathers did the education acts of eighteen seventy often in these days too sweepingly denounced did a vast deal of good along with no small amount of definite harm at the head of the harmful effects must i think be set its discouragement of bible reading and this chiefly through its encouraging parents to believe that they could henceforth hand over the training of their children to the state lock stock and barrel you all remember the picture in burns of the cotter's saturday night the cheerful supper done with serious face they round the ingle form a circle wide the tsar turns o'er with patriarchal grace the big hay bible and his father's pride his bonnet reverently is laid aside his lyre habits wearing thin and bare those strains that once did sweet and zion glide he wails a portion with judicious care and let us worship god he says with solemn air but you know that the sire a bred on the tradition of eighteen seventy and now growing gray does nothing of that sort on a saturday night that saturday being tub night he inclines rather to order the children into the back kitchen to get washed that on sunday morning having seen them off to a place of worship he inclines to sit down and read in place of the bible his sunday newspaper that in the afternoon he again shunts them off to sunday school now to speak first of the children 
it is good for them to be tubbed on saturday night good for them also i dare say to attend sunday school on the following afternoon but not good in so far as they miss to hear the bible read by their parents and pure religion breathing household laws pure religion well perhaps that begs the question and i dare say burns cotter when he wailed a portion with judicious care wailed it as often as not perhaps oftener than not to contradict and confute that often he contradicted and confuted very crudely very ignorantly but we may call it simple religion anyhow sincere religion parental religion household religion and for a certainty no lessons in day school or sunday school have for tinging a child's mind an effect comparable with that of a religion pervading the child's home present at bedside and board here a little child i stand heaving up my either hand cold as paddocks though they be here i lift them up to thee for a benison to fall on our meat and on us all amen permeating the house subtly instilled by the very accent of his father's and his mother's speech for the grown man i happen to come from a part of england editor cornwall where men in all my days have been curiously concerned with religion and are yet so concerned so much that you can scarce take up a local paper and turn to the correspondence column but you will find some heated controversy raging over free will and predestination the validity of holy orders original sin redemption of the many or the few go it justice go it mercy go it douglas go it percy but the contestants do not write in the language their fathers used they seem to have lost the vocabulary and to have picked up in place of it the jargon of the yellow press which does not tend to clear definition on points of theology the mass of all this controversial stuff is no more absurd no more frantic than it used to be but in language it has lost its dignity with its homeliness it has lost the coloring of the scriptures the intonation of the scriptures the scriptural habit if i turn from it to a passage in bunyan i am conversing with a man who though he has read few other books has imbibed and soaked the authorized version into his fibers so that he cannot speak but biblically listen to this as to the situation of this town it lieth just between the two worlds and the first founder and builder of it so far as by the best and most authentic records i can gather was one shaddai and he built it for his own delight he made it the mirror and glory of all that he made even the top piece beyond anything else that he did in that country yea so goodly a town was mansoul when first built that it is said by some the gods at the setting up thereof came down to see it and sang for joy the wall of the town was well built yea so fast and firm was it knit and compact together that had it not been for the townsmen themselves they could not have been shaken or broken for ever or take this now as they were going along and talking they espied a boy feeding his father's sheep the boy was in very mean clothes but of a very fresh and well-favoured countenance and as he sate by himself he sung then said their guide do you hear him i will dare to say that this boy lives a merrier life and wears more of that herb called heart's ease in his bosom than he that is clad in silk and velvet i choose ordinary passages not solemn ones in which bunyan is consciously scriptural but you cannot miss the accent that is bunyan of course and i am far from saying that the laboring men among whom i grew up at the fishery or in the hayfield talked with bunyan's magic but i do assert that they had something of the accent enough to be like in a child's mind the fishermen and laborers among whom christ found his first disciples they had the large simplicity of speech the cadence the accent but let me turn to ireland where though not directly derived from our english bible a similar scriptural accent survives among the peasantry and is i hope ineradicable 
I choose two sentences from a book of memories recently written by the survivor of the two ladies who together wrote the incomparable Irish R.M. The first was uttered by a small cultivator who was asked why his potato crop had failed. I couldn't hardly say, was the answer. Whatever it was, God spurned them in a boggy place. Is that not the accent of Isaiah? He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. The other is the benediction bestowed upon the late Miss Violet Martin by a beggar woman in Skibbereen. Sure, you're always laughing what you may laugh in the sight of the glory of heaven. 6. But one now sees, or seems to see, that we children did in our time read the Bible a great deal, if perforce we were taught to read it in sundry bad ways, of which perhaps the worst was that our elders hammered in all the books, all the parts of it, as equally inspired and therefore equivalent. Of course, this meant, among other things, that they hammered it all in literally. But let us not sentimentalize over that. It really did no child any harm to believe that the universe was created in a working week of six days, and that God sat down and looked at it on Sunday, and behold, it was very good. A week is quite a long while to a child, yet a definite division rounding off a square job. The bath taps at home usually, for some unexplained reason, went wrong during the weekend. The plumber came in on Monday and carried out his tools on Saturday at midday. These little analogies really do, I believe, help the infant mind, and not at all to its later detriment. Nor shall I ask you to sentimentalize over much upon the harm done to a child by teaching him that the bloodthirsty, jealous Jehovah of the book of Joshua is as venerable, being one and the same unalterably, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, as the Father, the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy, revealed to us in the gospel, invoked for us at the Eucharist. I do most seriously hold it to be fatal if we grow up and are fossilized in any such belief. Where have we better proof than in the invocations which the family of the Hohenzollerns have been putting up any time since August 1914 and for years before to this bloody identification of the Christian man's God with Joshua's? My simple advice is that you not only read the Bible early, but read it again and again. And if on the third or fifth reading it leave you just where the first left you, if you still get from it no historical sense of a race developing its concept of God, well then, the point of the advice is lost, and there is no more to be said. But over this business of teaching the book of Joshua to children, I am in some doubt. A few years ago, an education committee, of which I happened to be chairman, sent ministers of religion, about two by two, to test the religious instruction given in elementary schools. Of the two who worked around my immediate neighborhood, one was a young priest of the Church of England, a medievalist with an ardent passion for ritual. The other, a gentle congregational minister, a mere holy and humble man of heart. They became great friends in the course of these expeditions, and they brought back this report. It is positively wicked to let these children grow up being taught that there is no difference in value between Joshua and St. Matthew, that the God of the Lord's Prayer is the same who commanded the massacre of I. Well, perhaps it is. Seeing how bloodthirsty old men can be in these days, one is tempted to think that they can hardly be caught too young and taught decency, if not mansuetude. But I do not remember as a child feeling any horror about it or any difficulty in reconciling the two concepts. Children are a bit bloodthirsty, and I observe that two volumes of the late Captain Maine Reed, The Rifle Rangers and The Scalp Hunters, have just found their way into the world's classics, and are advertised alongside of Ruskin's and Sesame and Lilies, 
and the de amitizione christi i leave you to think this out adding but this for a suggestion that as the hebrew outgrew his primitive tribal beliefs so the bettering mind of man casts off the old clouts of primitive doctrine he being in fact better than his religion you have all heard preachers trying to show that jacob was a better fellow than esau somehow you have all i hope rejected every such explanation esau was a gentleman jacob was not the instinct of a young man meets that wall and there is no passing it later the mind of the youth perceives that the writer of jacob's history has a tribal mind and supposes throughout that for the advancement of his tribe many things are permissible and even admirable which a later and urbaner mind rejects as detestably sharp practice and the story of jacob becomes the more valuable to us historically as we realize what a hero he is to the bland chronicler seven but of another thing gentlemen i am certain that we were badly taught in that these books which preached to us as equivalent were kept in separate compartments we were taught the books of kings and chronicles as history the prophets were the prophets inspired men predicting the future which they only did by chance as every inspired man does isaiah was never put into relation with his time at all which means everything to our understanding of isaiah whether of jerusalem or of babylon we ploughed through kings and chronicles and made out lists of rulers with dates and capital events isaiah was all fine writing about nothing at all and historically we were concerned with him only to verify some far-fetched reference to the messiah in this or that evangelist but there is not never has been really fine literature like isaiah composed about nothing at all and in the mere matter of prognostication i doubt if such experts as zankiel and old moore have anything to fear from any school of writing we can build up in cambridge but if we had only been taught to read isaiah concurrently with the books of the kings what a fire it would have kindled among the dry bones of our studies then said the lord unto isaiah go forth now to meet ahaz thou and shear jashub thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field scholars of course know the political significance of that famous meeting but if we had only known it if we had only been taught what assyria was with its successive monarchs tiglath pileser shalmaneser sargon sennacherib and why syria and israel and egypt were trying to cajole or force judah into alliance what a difference i say this passage would have meant to us eight i dare say after all that the best way is not to bother a boy too early and overmuch with history that the best way is to let him ramp at first through the scriptures even as he might through the arabian nights to let him take the books as they come merely indicating for instance that job is a great poem the songs great lyrics the story of ruth a lovely idol the song of songs the perfection of an eastern love poem well and what then he will certainly get less of the cotter saturday night into it and certainly more of the truth of the east there he will feel the whole splendid barbaric story for himself the flocks of abraham and laban the trek of jacob's sons to egypt for corn the figures of rebecca at the well ruth at the gleaning and rizpah beneath the gibbet sisera bowing in weariness saul great saul by the tent prop with the jewels in his turban all its lordly male sapphires and rubies courageous at heart or consider to choose one or two pictures out of the tremendous procession consider michal saul's loyal daughter how first she is given in marriage to david to be a snare for him how loving him she saves his life letting him down from the window and dressing up an image on the bed in his place 
how later she is handed over to another husband flatiel how david demands her back and she goes and her husband flatiel went with her along weeping behind her to barurum then said abner unto him go return and he returned or still later how the revulsion takes her saul's daughter as she sees david capering home before the ark and how her affection had done with this emotional man of the ruddy countenance so prone to weep in his bed and as the ark of the lord came into the city of david michel saul's daughter mark the three words michel saul's daughter looked through a window and saw king david leaping and dancing before the lord and she despised him in her heart the whole story goes into about ten lines your psychological novelist nowadays given the wit to invent it would make it cover five hundred pages at least or take the end of david in the first two chapters of the first book of kings with its tale of oriental intrigues plots treacheries murderings in the depths of the horrible palace wherein the old man is dying or read of solomon and his ships and his builders and see his temple growing as heber put it like a tall palm with no sound of hammers or read again the end of queen athaliah and when athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people she came to the people into the temple of the lord and when she looked behold the king stood by a pillar as the manner was and the princes and the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets and athaliah rent her clothes and cried treason treason but Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds the officers of the host and said unto them have her forth without the ranges and they laid hands on her and she went by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house and there was she slain let a youngster read this i say just as it is written and how the true east sound scent form colour pours into the narrative symbols and trumpets leagues of sand caravans trailing through the heat priests and soldiery and kings going up between them to the altar blood at the foot of the steps blood everywhere smell of blood mingled with spices sandalwood dung of camels yes but how if you will permit the word how the enjoyment of it as magnificent literature might be enhanced by a scholar who would condescend to whisper of his knowledge the magical word here and there to the child as he reads for instance no child no grown man with any sense of poetry can deny his ear to the forty-fifth psalm the one that begins oh, my heart is inditing a good matter and plunges into a hymn of royal nuptials first you remember the singing men the sons of korah lift their chant to the bridegroom the king gird thy sword upon thy thigh o most mighty and in thy majesty ride prosperously or as we hear it in the book of common prayer good luck have thou with thine honour because of the word of truth of meekness and righteousness and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things all thy garments smell of myrrh aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad anon they turn to the bride hearken o daughter and consider and incline thine ear forget also thine own people and thy father's house the king's daughter is all glorious within her clothing is of wrought gold she shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework the virgins that be her fellows shall bear her company and the daughter of tyre shall be there with a gift instead of thy father shall be thy children whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth for whom wonders the young reader spellbound by this for what happy bride and bridegroom was this glorious chant raised now suppose that just here he has a scholar ready to tell him what is likely is true that the bridegroom was ahab that the bride the daughter of sidon was no other than jezebel and became what jezebel now is 
with what an awe of surmise would two other passages of the history toll on his ear and one washed the chariot in the pool of samaria and the dogs licked up his blood and when he jesu was come in he did eat and drink and said go see now this cursed woman and bury her for she is a king's daughter and they went to bury her but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands wherefore they came again and told him and he said this is the word of the lord which he spake by his servant elijah the tishbite saying in the portion of jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of jezebel so that men shall not say this is jezebel in another lecture gentlemen i propose to take up the argument and attempt to bring it to this point how can we having this incomparable work necessary for study by all who would write english bring it within the ambit of the english tripos and yet avoid offending the experts end of part one Part Two of On Reading the Bible by Arthur Quiller Couch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. One. We left off last term, gentlemen, upon a note of protest. We wondered why it should be that our English version of the Bible lies under the ban of schoolmasters, boards of studies, and all who devise courses of reading and examinations in English literature that among our prescribed books we find chaucer's prologue we find hamlet we find paradise lost we find pope's essay on man again and again but the book of job never the vicar of wakefield and gray's elegy often but ruth or isaiah ecclesiasticus or wisdom never i propose this morning one to inquire into the reasons for this so far as i can guess and interpret them two to deal with such reasons as we can discover or surmise three to suggest today some simple first aid and in another lecture taking for experiment a single book from the authorized version some practical ways of including it in the ambit of our new english tripos this will compel me to be definite and as definite proposals and by definite objections by this method we are likeliest to know where we are and if the reform we seek be realizable or illusory two i shall ask you then first to assent with me that the authorized version of the holy bible is as a literary achievement one of the greatest in our language nay with the possible exception of the complete works of shakespeare the very greatest you will certainly not deny this as little or less will you deny that more deeply than any other book more deeply even than all the writings of shakespeare far more deeply it has influenced our literature here let me repeat a short passage from a former lecture of mine may fifteen nineteen thirteen five years ago i had quoted some few glorious sentences such as thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty they shall behold the land that is very far off and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality and having quoted these i went on when a nation has achieved this manner of diction these rhythms for its dearest beliefs a literature is surely established wycliffe tyndale coverdale and others before the forty seven had wrought the authorized version setting a seal on all set a seal on our national style it has a cadence homely and sublime yet so harmonizes them that the voice is always one simple men holy and humble men of heart like isaac walton and bunyan have their lips touched and speak to the homelier tune proud men scholars milton sir thomas brown practice the rolling latin sentence 
but upon the rhythms of our bible they too fall back the great mutations of the world are acted or time may be too short for our designs acquaint thyself with the corrigium of the stars there is nothing immortal but immortality the precise man addison cannot excel one parable in brevity or in heavenly clarity the two parts of johnson's antithesis come to no more than this our lord has gone up to the sound of a trump with the sound of a trump our lord has gone up the bible controls its enemy gibbon as surely as it haunts the curious music of a light sentence of thackeray's it is in everything we see hear feel because it is in us in our blood if that be true or less than gravely overstated if the english bible hold this unique place in our literature if it be at once a monument an example and best of all a well of english undefiled no stagnant water but quick running curative refreshing vivifying may we not agree gentlemen to require the weightiest reason why our instructors should continue to hedge in the temple and pipe the fountain off in professional conduits forbidding it to irrigate freely our ground of study it is done so complacently that i do not remember to have met one single argument put up in defence of it and so i am reduced to guesswork what can be the justifying reason for an embargo on the face of it so silly and arbitrary if not senseless three does it reside perchance in some primitive instinct of a taboo of a superstition of fetish worship fencing off sacred things as unmentionable and reinforced by the bad puritan notion that holy things are by no means to be enjoyed if so i began by referring you to the greeks and their attitude towards the homeric poems we of course hold the old testament more sacred than homer but i very much doubt if it be more sacred to us than the iliad and the odyssey were to an old athenian in his day to the greeks and to forget this is the fruitfulest source of error in dealing with the tragedians or even with aristophanes to the greeks their religion such as it was mattered enormously they built their theatre upon it as we most certainly do not which means that it had sunk into their daily life and permeated their enjoyment of it as our religion certainly does not affect our life to enhance it as amusing or pleasurable we go to church on sunday and write it off as an observance but if eager to be happy with a free heart we close early and steal a few hours from the working day we antagonize religion and enjoyment worship and holiday nature being too strong for any convention of ours courtship has asserted itself as permissible on the sabbath if not as a sabbatical institution now the greeks were just as much slaves to the letter of their homer as any old licked elder to the letter of st paul no one will accuse plato of being over friendly to poetry yet i believe you will find in plato some one hundred and fifty direct citations from homer not to speak of allusions scattered broadcast through the dialogues often as texts for long argument of these citations and allusions an inordinate number seem to us laboriously trivial that is to say unless we put ourselves into the hellenic mind on the other hand plato uses others to enforce or illustrate his profoundest doctrines for an instance in phaedo paragraph ninety six socrates is arguing that the soul cannot be one with the harmony of the bodily affections being herself the master player who commands the strings almost always he says opposing and coercing them in all sorts of ways throughout life sometimes more violently with the pains of medicine and gymnastic then again more gently threatening and also reprimanding the desires passions fears as if talking to a thing which is not herself as homer in the odyssey represents odysseus doing in the words greek 
stethos de plexas cradion nipapai mutho tetlethi de cradi kai kentron allo po etles he beat his breast and thus reproached his heart endure my heart far worse hast thou endured do you think asked socrates that homer wrote this under the idea that the soul is a harmony capable of being led by the affections of the body and not rather of a nature which should lead and master them herself a far diviner thing than any harmony a greek then will use homer his bible minutely on niceties of conduct or broadly on first principles of philosophy or religion but equally since it is poetry all the time to him he will take or to instance particular writers aristotle and the late greek longinus will take a single hexameter to illustrate a minute trick of style or turn of phrase as equally he will choose a long passage or the whole iliad the whole odyssey to illustrate a grand rule of poetic construction a first principle of aesthetics for an example herein says aristotle starting to show that an epic poem must have unity of subject herein to repeat what we have said before we have a further proof of homer's superiority to the rest he did not attempt to deal even with the trojan war in its entirety though it was a whole story with a definite beginning middle and end feeling apparently that it was too long a story to be taken in at one view or else overcomplicated by variety of incidents and as aristotle takes the iliad his bible to illustrate a grand rule of poetical construction so the late writer of his tradition longinus will use it to exhibit the core and essence of poetical sublimity as in his famous ninth chapter of which gibbon wrote the ninth chapter of the greek periupsus or de sublimite of longinus is one of the finest monuments of antiquity till now i was acquainted only with two ways of criticizing a beautiful passage the one to show by an exact anatomy of it the distinct beauties of it and whence they sprung the other an idle exclamation or a general encomium which leaves nothing behind it longinus has shown me that there is a third he tells me his own feelings upon reading it and tells them with so much energy that he communicates them i almost doubt which is more sublime homer's battle of the gods or longinus apostrophe to tarentianus upon it well let me quote you in translation a sentence or two from this chapter which produced upon gibbon such an effect as almost to anticipate walter pater's famous definition to feel the virtue of the poet of the painter to disengage it to set it forth these are the three stages of the critic's duty elsewhere says longinus i have written as follows sublimity is the echo of a great soul sublimity is the echo of a great soul it was worth repeating too was it not for it is not possible that men with mean and servile ideas and aims prevailing throughout their lives should produce anything that is admirable and worthy of immortality great accents we expect to fall from the lips of those whose thoughts are deep and grave hear how magnificently homer speaks of the higher powers as far as a man seeth with his eyes into the haze of distance as he sitteth upon a cliff of outlook and gazeth over the wine-dark sea even so far at a bound leap the neighing horses of the gods he makes says longinus the vastness of the world the measure of their leap then after a criticism of the battle of the gods too long to be quoted here he goes on much superior to the passages respecting the battle of the gods are those which represent the divine nature as it really is pure and great and undefiled for example what is said of poseidon 
her far-stretching ridges her forest trees quaked in dismay and her peaks and the trojans town and the ships of achaia's array beneath his immortal feet as onward poseidon strode then over the surges he drave leapt sporting before the god sea beasts that uprose all round from the depths for their king they knew and for rapture the sea was disparted and onward the car steeds flew now then how does longinus conclude why very strangely very strangely indeed whether you take the treatise to be by that longinus the rhetorician and zenobia's adviser whom the emperor aurelian put to death or prefer to believe it the work of an unknown hand in the first century the treatise goes on similarly the legislator of the jews uh, moses no ordinary man having formed and expressed a worthy conception of the might of the godhead writes at the very beginning of his laws god said what let there be light and there was light four so here gentlemen you have plato aristotle longinus all greeks of separate states men of eminence all three and two of surpassing eminence all three and each in his time and turn treating homer reverently as holy writ and yet enjoying it liberally as poetry for indeed the true greek mind had no thought to separate poetry from religion as to the true greek mind reverence and liberty to enjoy with the liberty of mind that helps to enjoy were all tributes to the same divine thing they had no professionals no puritans to hedge it off with a taboo and so when the last and least of the three longinus comes to our holy writ the sublime poetry in which christendom reads its god his open mind at once recognizes it as poetry and as sublime god said let there be light and there was light if longinus could treat this as sublime poetry why cannot we who have translated and made it ours five are we forbidden on the ground that our bible is directly inspired well inspiration as sir william davenant observed and rather wittily proved in his preface to gondelebert is a dangerous term it is dangerous mainly because it is a relative term a term of degrees you may say definitely of some things that the writer was inspired as you may certify a certain man to be mad that is so thoroughly and convincingly mad that you can order him under restraint but quite a number of us are as they say in my part of the world not exactly and one or two of us here and there at moments may have a touch even of inspiration so of the bible itself i suppose that few nowadays would contend it to be all inspired equally no you may say not all equally but all of it directly as no other book is to that i might answer how do you know that direct inspiration ceased with the revelation of st john the divine and closed the book it may be but how do you know and what authority have you to say that wordsworth's tintern abbey for example or browning's great invocation of love was not directly inspired certainly the men who wrote them were wrapped above themselves and if not directly why indirectly and how but i pause on the edge of a morass and spring back to firmer ground our bible as we have it is a translation made by forty-seven men and published in the year sixteen eleven the original and i am still on firm ground because i am quoting now from the cambridge history of english literature either proceeds from divine inspiration as some will have it or according to others is the fruit of the religious genius of the hebrew race from either point of view the authors are highly gifted individuals highly gifted individuals who notwithstanding their diversities and the progressiveness observable in their representations of the nature of god are wonderfully consistent in the main tenor of their writings and serve in general for mutual confirmation and illustration 
in some cases this may be due to the revision of earlier productions by later writers which has thus brought more primitive conceptions into a degree of conformity with maturer and profounder views but even in such cases the earlier conception often lends itself without wrenching to the deeper interpretation and the completer exposition the bible is not distinctively an intellectual achievement in all earnest i protest that to write about the bible in such a fashion is to demonstrate inferentially that it has never quickened you with its glow that whatever your learning you have missed what the unlearned bunyan for example so admirably caught the true wit of the book the writer to be sure is dealing with the originals let us more humbly sit at the feet of the translators highly gifted individuals or no the sort of thing the translators wrote was and god said let there be light a sower went forth to sow the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took the wages of sin is death the trumpet shall sound jesus wept death is swallowed up in victory let me quote you for better encouragement as well as for relief a passage from matthew arnold on the authorized version the effect of hebrew poetry can be preserved and transferred in a foreign language as the effect of other great poetry cannot the effect of homer the effect of dante is and must be in great measure lost in a translation because their poetry is a poetry of metre or of rhyme or both and the effect of these is not really transferable a man may make a good english poem with the matter and thoughts of homer and dante may even try to reproduce their metre or rhyme but the metre and rhyme will be in truth his own and the effect will be his not the effect of homer or dante isaiah's on the other hand is a poetry as is well known of parallelism it depends not on metre and rhyme but on a balance of thought conveyed by a corresponding balance of sentence and the effect of this can be transferred to another language hebrew poetry has in addition the effect of assonance and other effects which cannot perhaps be transferred but its main effect its effect of parallelism of thought and sentence can i take this from the preface to his little volume in which arnold confesses that his paramount object is to get isaiah enjoyed six sundry men of letters besides matthew arnold have pleaded for a literary study of the bible and especially of our english version that we may thereby enhance our enjoyment of the work itself and through this enjoyment and understanding of the rest of english literature from sixteen eleven down specially among these pleaders let me mention mr f b moneycutts now lord latimer and a cambridge man dr r g moulton now professor of literary theory and interpretation in the university of chicago of both these writers i shall have something to say but first and generally if you ask me why all their pleas have not yet prevailed i will give you my own answer the fault as usual lies in ourselves in our own tameness and in curiosity there is no real trouble with the taboo set up by professionals and puritans if we have the courage to walk past it as christian walked between the lions no real tyranny we could not overthrow if it were worth while with a push no need at all for us to wreathe our sword in myrtle boughs what tyranny exists has grown up through the quite well-meaning labors of quite well-meaning men and as i started this lecture by saying i have never heard any serious reason given why we should not include portions of the english bible in our english tripos if we choose nos te nos facimus scriptura deam then why don't we choose to answer this we must i suggest seek somewhat further back the bible that is to say the body of the old hebrew literature clothed for us in english comes to us in our childhood but how does it come 
let me amplifying a hint from dr moulton ask you to imagine a volume including the great books of our own literature all bound together in some such order as this paradise lost darwin's descent of man the anglo-saxon chronicle walter map mill on liberty hooker's ecclesiastical polity the annual register frossert adam smith's wealth of nations domesday book la mort d'arthur campbell's lives of the lord chancellors boswell's johnson barber's the bruce hacklett's voyages clarendon mackeldy the plays of shakespeare shelley's prometheus unbound the fairy queen paul graves golden treasury bacon's essays swinburne's poems and ballads fitzgerald's omar khayyam wordsworth browning sartor resartus burton's anatomy of melancholy burke's letters on a regicide piece ossian pierce plowman burke's thoughts on the present discontents quarrels newman's apologia dunn's sermons ruskin blake the deserted village manfred blair's grave the complaint of door bailey's festus thompson's hound of heaven will you next imagine that in this volume most of the author's names are lost that of the few that survive a number have found their way into wrong places that ruskin for example is credited with sartor resartus that laus veneris and dolores are ascribed to queen elizabeth the anatomy of melancholy to charles the second and that as for the titles these were never invented by the authors but by a committee will you still go on to imagine that all the poetry is printed as prose while all the long paragraphs of prose are broken up into short verses so that they resemble the little passages set out for parsing or analysis in an examination paper this device as you know was first invented by the exiled translators who published the geneva bible as it is called in fifteen fifty seven and for pulpit use for handiness of reference for wailing a portion as it has its obvious advantages but it is after all and at the best a very primitive device and for my part i consider it the deadliest invention of all for robbing the book of outward resemblance to literature and converting it to the aspect of a gazetteer a biblion a biblion as charles lamb puts it have we done by no means having effected all this let us pepper the result over with italics and numerals printed in double columns with a marginal gutter on either side each gutter pouring down an inky flow of references and cross-references then and not till then is the outward disguise complete so far as you are concerned it remains only then to appoint it to be read in churches and oblige the child to get selected portions of it by heart on sundays but you are yet to imagine that the authors themselves have taken a hand in the game that the later ones suppose all the earlier ones to have been predicting all the time in a nebulous fashion what they themselves have to tell and indeed to have written mainly with that object so that macaulay and adam smith for example constantly interrupt the thread of their discourse to affirm that what they tell us must be right because walter map or the author of piers plowman foretold it ages before now a grown man that is to say a comparatively unimpressionable man that is again to say a man past the age when to enjoy the bible is priceless has probably found out somehow that the word prophet does not in spite of vulgar usage mean a man who predicts he has experienced too many prophets of that kind especially since nineteen fourteen and he respects isaiah too much to rank isaiah among them he has been in love belike he has read the song of solomon he very much doubts if on the evidence solomon was the kind of lover to have written that song and he is quite certain that when the lover sings to his beloved thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins thy neck is as a tower of ivory thine eyes like the fish pools in hezban by the gate of bath rabim 
he knows i say that this is not a description of the church and her graces as the chapter heading audaciously asserts but he is lazy too lazy even to commend the revised version for striking solomon out of the bible calling the poem the song of songs omitting the absurd chapter headings and printing the poetry as poetry ought to be printed the old-fashioned arrangement was good enough for him or he goes to church on christmas day and listens to a first lesson of which the old translators made nonsense and in two passages at least stark nonsense but again the old nonsense is good enough for him soothing in fact he is not even quite sure that the bible looking like any other book ought to be put in the hands of the young in all this i think he is wrong i am sure he is wrong if our contention be right that the english bible should be studied by us all for its poetry and its wonderful language as well as for its religion the religion and the poetry being in fact inseparable for then in euripides phrase we should clothe the bible in a dress through which its beauty might best shine seven if you ask me how i answer first begging you to bear in mind that we are planning the form of the book for our purpose and that other forms will be used for other purposes that we should start with the simplest alterations such as these one the books should be rearranged in their right order so far as this can be ascertained and much of it has been ascertained i am told and i can well believe that this would at a stroke clear away a mass of confusion in strictly biblical criticism but that is not my business i know that it would immensely help our literary study two i should print the prose continuously as prose is ordinarily and properly printed and the poetry in verse lines as poetry is ordinarily and properly printed and i should print each on a page of one column with none but the necessary notes and references and these so arranged that they did not tease and distract the eye three this arrangement should be kept whether for the tripos we prescribe a book in the authorized text or in the revised as a rule perhaps or as a rule for some years to come we shall probably rely on the authorized version but for some books and i instance job we should undoubtedly prefer the revised with the verse we should i hold go farther even than the revisers as you know much of the poetry in the bible especially of such as was meant for music is composed in stanzaic form or in strophe and antistrophe with prelude and conclusion sometimes with a choral refrain we should print these i contend in their proper form just as we should print an english poem in its proper form i shall conclude to-day with a striking instance of this with four strophes from the one hundred and seventh psalm taking leave to use at will the authorized the revised and the coverdale versions each strophe you will note has a double refrain as dr moulton points out the one puts up a cry for help the other an ejaculation of praise after the help has come each refrain has a sequel verse which appropriately changes the motive and sets that of the next stanza one they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way they found no city to dwell in hungry and thirsty their soul fainted in them then they cried unto the lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses he led them forth by a straight way that they might go to a city of habitation oh that men would praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness two such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death being bound in affliction and iron because they rebelled against the words of god and contemned the counsel of the most high therefore he brought down their heart with labor they fell down and there was none to help then they cried unto the lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and brake their bands in sunder 
oh that men would praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men for he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder three fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted their soul abhorreth all manner of meat and they draw near unto death's door then they cry unto the lord in their trouble and he saveth them out of their distresses he sendeth his word and healeth them and delivereth them from their destruction o oh, that men would praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men and let them offer the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with singing four they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters these see the works of the lord and his wonders in the deep for he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof they mount up to the heaven they go down again to the depths their soul melteth away because of trouble they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end then they cry unto the lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses he maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still then are they glad because they be quiet so he bringeth them unto the haven where they would be oh that men would praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the seat of the elders footnote one i borrow the verse and impart the prose of professor w reese roberts translation end of part two part three of on reading the bible by arthur quiller couch this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 1. My task today, gentlemen, is mainly practical, to choose a particular book of Scripture and show, if I can, not only that it deserves to be enjoyed in its English rendering as a literary masterpiece because it abides in that dress, an indisputable classic for us, as surely as if it had first been composed in English but that it can for purposes of study serve the purpose of any true literary school of english as readily and as usefully as the prologue to the canterbury tales or hamlet or paradise lost i shall choose the book of job for several reasons presently to be given but beg you to understand that while taking it for a striking illustration i use it but to illustrate that what may be done with job may in degree be done with ruth with esther and with the psalms the song of songs ecclesiastes with isaiah of jerusalem ezekiel sundry of the prophets even with st luke's gospel or st paul's letters to the churches my first reason then for choosing job has already been given it is the most striking illustration to be found many of the psalms touch perfection as lyrical strains of the ecstasy of passion and love i suppose the song of songs to express the very last word there are chapters of isaiah that snatch the very soul and ravish it aloft in no literature known to me are short stories told with such sweet austerity of art as in the gospel parables i can even imagine a high and learned artist in words after rejecting them as divine on many grounds surrendering in the end to their divine artistry but for high seriousness combined with architectonic treatment on a great scale for sublimity of conception working malleably within a structure which is simple severe complete having a beginning a middle and an end for diction never less than adequate constantly right and therefore not seldom superb as theme thought and utterance soar up together and make one miracle i can name no single book of the bible to compare with job 
my second reason is that the poem being brief compendious and quite simple in structure can be handily expounded job is what milton precisely called it a brief model and my third reason which i must not hide is that two writers whom i mentioned in my last lecture lord latimer and professor r g moulton have already done this for me a man who drives at practice must use the tools other men have made so he used them with due acknowledgment and this acknowledgment i pay by referring you to book two of lord latimer's the poet's charter and to the analysis of job with which professor moulton introduces his literary study of the bible two but i have a fourth reason out of which i might make an apparent fifth by presenting it to you in two different ways those elders of you who have followed certain earlier lectures on the art of writing may remember that they set very little store upon meter as a dividing line between poetry and prose and no store at all upon rhyme i am tempted to-day to go farther and to maintain that the larger the sublimer your subject is the more impertinent rhyme becomes to it and that this impertinence increases in a sort of geometrical progression as you advance from monosyllabic to disyllabic and on to trisyllabic rhyme let me put this by a series of examples we start with no rhyme at all hail holy light offspring of heaven firstborn or of the eternal co-eternal beam may i express thee unblamed since god is light and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity we feel of this as we feel of a great passage in hamlet or lear that here is verse at once capable of the highest sublimity and capable of sustaining its theme of lifting and lowering it at will with endless resource in the slide and pause of the caesura to carry it on and on we feel it to be adequate too for quite plain straightforward narrative as in the passage from balder dead but from the hill of lidiscalf odin rose the throne from which his eye surveys the world and mounted sleipner and in darkness rode to asgard and the stars came out in heaven high over asgard to light home the king but fiercely odin galloped moved in heart and swift to asgard to the gate he came and terribly the hoofs of sleipner rang along the flinty floor of asgard streets and the gods trembled on their golden beds hearing the wrathful father coming home for dread for like a whirlwind odin came and to valhalla's gate he rode and left sleipner and sleipner went to his own stall and in valhalla odin laid him down now of rhyme he were a fool who with lycidas or gray's elegy or certain choruses of prometheus unbound or page after page of victor hugo in his mind should assert it to be in itself inimical or a hindrance or even less than a help to sublimity or who with dante in his mind should assert it to be in itself any bar to continuous and sustained sublimity but languages differ vastly in their wealth of rhyme and differ out of any proportion to their wealth in words english for instance being infinitely richer than italian in vocabulary yet almost ridiculously poorer in disyllabic or feminine rhymes speaking generally i should say that in proportion to its wonderful vocabulary english is poor even in single rhymes that the words love truth god for example have lists of possible congeners so limited that the mind hearing the word love runs forward to match it with dove or above or even with move and this gives it a sense of arrest of listening of check of waiting which alike impedes the flow of pope in imitating homer and of spencer in essaying a sublime and continuous story of his own 
it does well enough to carry chaucer over any gap with a forsooth as i you say or forsooth as i you tell but it does so at a total cost of the sublime and this i think was really at the back of milton's mind when in the preface to paradise lost he championed blank verse against the jingling sound of like endings but when we pass from single rhymes to double of which dante had an inexhaustible store we find the english poet almost a pauper so nearly a pauper that he has to achieve each new rhyme by a trick which tricking is fatal to rapture alike in the poet and the hearer let me instance a poem which planned for sublimity keeps tumbling flat upon earth through the inherent fault of the machine i mean myers's st paul a poem which finally conceived pondered worked and reworked upon in edition after edition was from the first condemned to my mind by the technical bar of disyllabic rhyme which the poet unhappily chose i take one of its most deeply felt passages that of st paul protesting against his conversion being taken for instantaneous wholly accounted for by the miraculous vision related in the acts of the apostles let no man think that sudden in a minute all is accomplished and the work is done though with thine earliest dawn thou shouldst begin it scarce were it ended in thy setting sun o oh, the regret the struggle and the failing o oh, the days desolate and useless years vows in the night so fierce and unavailing stings of my shame and passion of my tears how have i seen in araby orion seen without seeing till he set again known the night noise and thunder of the lion silence and sounds of the prodigious plain how have i knelt with arms of my aspiring lifted all night in irresponsive air dazed and amazed with overmuch desiring blank with the utter agony of prayer what ye shall say and thou who at damascus sawest the splendour answerest the voice so hast thou suffered and canst dare to ask us paul of the romans bidding us rejoice you cannot say i have instance a passage anything short of fine but do you not feel that a man who is searching for a rhyme to damascus has not really the time to cry abba father is not your own rapture interrupted by some wonder how will he bring it off and when he has searched and contrived to ask us are we responsive to the ecstasy has he not if i may employ an oriental trope for once let in the chill breath of cleverness upon the garden of beatitude no man can be clever and ecstatic at the same moment as for triple rhymes rhymes of the comedian who had a lot of news from any curious facts about the square of the hypotenuse or the cassowary who ate the missionary on the plains of timbuktu with bible prayer book hymn book too they are for the facetious and removed as far as geometrical procession can move them from any paradise lost or regained it may sound a genuine note now and then alas for the rarity of christian charity under the sun oh it was pitiful near a whole city full home she had none but not often and i think never but in lyric three so much then for rhyme we will approach the question of meter helped or unhelped by rhyme in another way and a way yet more practical when milton determined to write a grand epic was casting about for his subject he had a mind for some while to attempt the story of job you may find evidence for this in a manuscript preserved here at trinity college library you will find printed evidence in a passage of his reason of church government time serves not now he writes 
and perhaps i might seem too profuse to give any certain account of what the mind at home in the spacious circuits of her musing hath liberty to propose to herself though of highest hope and hardest attempting whether that epic form whereof the two poems of homer and those other two of virgil and tasso are a diffuse and the book of job a brief model again we know job to have been one of the three stories meditated by shelley as themes for great lyrical dramas the other two being the madness of tasso and prometheus unbound shelley never abandoned this idea of a lyrical drama on job and if milton abandoned the idea of an epic there are passages in paradise lost as there are passages in prometheus unbound that might well have been written for this other story take the lines why am i mocked with death and lengthened out to deathless pain how gladly would i meet mortality my sentence and be earth insensible how glad would lay me down as in my mother's lap there i should rest and sleep secure what is this as lord latimer asked but an echo of job's words for now should i have lien down and been quiet i should have slept then had i been at rest with kings and counsellors of the earth which built desolate places for themselves there the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There is no need for me to point out how exactly, though from two nearly opposite angles, the story of Job would hit the philosophy of Milton and the philosophy of Shelley to the very heart. What is the story of the afflicted patriarch but a direct challenge to a Protestant like Milton? I use the word in its strictest sense, to justify the ways of God to man. It is the very purpose, in some, of the book of Job, as it is the very purpose, in some, of Paradise Lost. And since both poems can only work out the justification by long argumentative speeches, both poems lamentably fail as real solutions of the difficulty. To this I shall recur and here merely observe that qui se excusa, se accusa. A god who can only explain himself by the help of long-winded scolding or of long-winded advocacy, though he employ an archangel for advocate, has given away the half of his case by the implicit admission that there are two sides to the question and when we have put aside the poetical ineptitude of a creator driven to apology it remains that to shelley the jehovah who for a sort of wager allowed satan to torture job merely for the game of testing him would be no better than any other tyrant would be a miscreant creator abominable as the zeus of the prometheus unbound now you may urge that milton and shelley dropped job for hero because both felt him to be a merely static figure and that the one chose satan the rebel angel the other chose prometheus the rebel titan because both are active rebels and as epic and drama require action each of these heroes makes the thing move that satan and prometheus are not passive sufferers like job but souls as quick and fiery as byron's lucifer souls who dare use their immortality souls who dare look the omnipotent tyrant in his everlasting face and tell him that his evil is not good very well urge this urge it with all your might all the while you will be doing just what i desire you to do using job alongside prometheus unbound and paradise lost as a comparative work of literature but if you ask me for my own opinion why milton and shelley dropped their intention to make poems on the book of job it is that they no sooner tackled it than they found it to be a magnificent poem already and a poem on which with all their genius they found themselves unable to improve 
i want you to realize a thing most simple demonstrable by five minutes of practice yet so confused by conventional notions of what poetry is that i dare say it is to be equally demonstrable that milton and shelley discovered it only by experiment does this appear to you a bold thing to say of so tremendous an artist as milton well of course it would be cruel to quote in proof of his paraphrases of psalms one hundred fourteen and one hundred thirty six to set against the authorized versions when israel went out of egypt the house of jacob from a people of strange language such pomposity as when the blessed seed of Terah's faithful son, after long toil their liberty had won, or against, O oh, give thanks to him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth for ever, to him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth for ever. Such stuff as, Who did the solid earth ordain to rise above the watery plain, for his mercies I endure, ever faithful ever sure who by his all-commanding might did fill the new-made world with light for his mercies i endure ever faithful ever sure verses yet further weakened by the late sir william baker for hymns ancient and modern it were cruel i say to condemn these attempts as little above those of sternhold and hopkins or even of those of tate and brady for Milton made them at fifteen years old, and he who afterwards consecrated his youth to poetry soon learned to know better. And yet, bearing in mind the passages in Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, which paraphrase the scriptural narrative, I cannot forbear the suspicion that, though as an artist he had the instinct to feel it, he never quite won to knowing the simple fact that the thing had already been done and surpassingly well done he who did so much to liberate poetry from rhyme he even he who in the grand choruses of samson agonistes did so much to liberate it from strict metre never quite realized being hag-ridden by the fetish that rides between two panniers the sacred and the profane that this translation of job already belongs to the category of poetry is poetry already above metre and in rhythm far on its way to the insurpassable if rhyme be allowed to that greatest of arts if metre is not rhythm above both for her service here in a sentence how this poem uplifts the rhythm of the vulgate Ecce Deus Magnus Vincens, Scientium Nostrum, Numerus Anorum Eius Iniestabilitus. But here, in a longer passage, how our English rhythm swings and sways to the Hebrew parallels. Surely there is a mine for silver, and a place for gold which they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth, and brass is molten out of the stone man setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out to the furthest bound the stones of thick darkness and of the shadow of death he breaketh open a shaft away from where men sojourn they are forgotten of the foot that passes by they hang afar from men they swing to and fro as for the earth out of it cometh bread and underneath it is turned up as it were by fire the stones thereof are the place of sapphires and it hath dust of gold that path no bird of prey knoweth neither hath the falcon's eye seen it the proud beasts have not trodden it nor hath the fierce lion passed thereby he putteth forth his hand upon the flinty rock he overturneth the mountains by the roots he cutteth out channels among the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. He bindeth the streams that they trickle not, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The deep saith, It is not in me, and the sea saith, It is not with me. 
it cannot be gotten for gold neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof it cannot be valued with the gold of ophir with the precious onyx or the sapphire gold and glass cannot equal it neither shall the exchange thereof be jewels of fine gold no mention shall be made of coral or of crystal yea the price of wisdom is above rubies the topaz of ethiopia shall not equal it neither shall it be valued with pure gold whence then cometh wisdom and where is the place of understanding seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air destruction and death say we have heard a rumour thereof with our ears god understandeth the way thereof and he knoweth the place thereof for he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven to make a weight for the wind yea he meteth out the waters by measure when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder then did he see it and declare it he established it yea and searched it out and unto man he said behold the fear of the lord that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding is that poetry surely it is poetry can you improve it with the embellishments of rhyme and strict scansion well sundry bold men have tried and i will choose for your judgment the rendering of a part of the above passage by one who is by no means the worst of them a hardy anonymous scotsman his version was published at falkirk in eighteen sixty nine his hand on the rock the adventurer puts and mountains entire overturns by the roots new rivers in rocks are enchased by his might and everything precious revealed to his sight the floods from o'erflowing he bindeth at will and the thing that is hid bringeth forth by his skill but where real wisdom is found can he show or the place understanding inhabiteth no men know not the value the price of this gem tis not found in the land of the living with them it is not in me saith the depth and the sea with the voice of an echo repeats not in me i have a suspicion somehow that what the sea really answered in its northern vernacular was me either whence then cometh wisdom and where is the place understanding hath chosen since this is the case <laughs> enough this not only shows how that other rendering can be spoilt even to the point of burlesque by an attempt on preconceived notions to embellish it with metre and rhyme but it also hints that parallel verse will actually resent and abhor such embellishment even by the most skilled hand yet i repeat our version of job is poetry undeniable what follows why it follows that in the course of studying it as literature we have found experimentally settled for us and on the side of freedom a dispute in which scores of eminent critics have taken sides a dispute revived but yesterday if we omit the blank and devastated days of this war by the writers and apostles of vea libra can there be poetry without metre is free verse a true poetic form why our book of job being poetry unmistakable poetry of course there can to be sure it is these apostles are budding at an open door nothing remains for them but to go and write ver libre as fine as those of job in our english translation or suppose even that they write as well as monsieur paul fort they will yet be writing ancestrally not as innovators but as renewers nothing is done in literature by arguing whether or not this or that be possible or permissible the only way to prove it possible or permissible is to go and do it and then you are lucky indeed if some ancient writers have not forestalled you four now for another question much argued you will remember a few years ago is there 
can there be such a thing as a static theater a static drama most of you i dare say remember m meiterlink's definition of this and his demand for it to summarize him roughly he contends that the old drama the traditional the conventional drama lives by action that in aristotle's phrase it represents men doing greek pratenontus and resolves itself into a struggle of human wills whether against the gods as in ancient tragedy or against one another as in modern m meiterlink tells us there is a tragic element in the life of every day that is far more real far more penetrating far more akin to the true self that is in us than is the tragedy that lies in great adventure it goes beyond the determined struggle of man against man and desire against desire it goes beyond the eternal conflict of duty and passion its province is rather to reveal to us how truly wonderful is the mere act of living and to throw light upon the existence of the soul self-contained in the midst of ever restless immensities to hush the discourse of reason and sentiment so that above the tumult may be heard the solemn uninterrupted whisperings of man and his destiny to the tragic author he goes on later as to the mediocre painter who still lingers over historical pictures it is only the violence of the anecdote that appeals and in his representation thereof does the entire interest of his work consist indeed when i go to a theatre i feel as though i were spending a few hours with my ancestors who conceived life as though it were something that was primitive arid and brutal i am shown a deceived husband killing his wife a woman poisoning her lover a son avenging his father a father slaughtering his children murdered kings ravished virgins imprisoned citizens in a word all the sublimity of tradition but alas how superficial and material blood surface tears and death what can i learn from creatures who have but one fixed idea who have no time to live for that there is a rival a mistress whom it behooves them to put to death m meiterlink does not he says know if the static drama of his craving be impossible he inclines to think instancing some greek tragedies such as prometheus and corfori that it already exists but may we not out of the east the slow the stationary east fetch an instance more convincing five the drama of job opens with a prologue in the mouth of a narrator there is a man in the land of uz named job upright god-fearing of great substance in sheep cattle and oxen blessed also with seven sons and three daughters after telling of their family life how wholesome it is and pious and happy the prologue passes to a council held in heaven the lord sits there and the sons of god present themselves each from his province enters satan whom we had better call the adversary from his sphere of inspection the earth and reports the lord specially questions him concerning job pattern of men the adversary demurs doth job fear god for naught hast thou not set a hedge about his prosperity but put forth thy hand and touch all that he hath and he will renounce thee to thy face the lord gives leave for this trial to be made you will recall the opening of every man so in the midst of his wealth a messenger came to job and says the oxen were ploughing and the asses feeding beside them and the sabaeans fell upon them and took them away yea they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword and i only am escaped alone to tell thee while he was yet speaking there came also another and said the fire of god is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and i only am escaped alone to tell thee while he was yet speaking there came also another and said 
the chaldeans made three bands and fell upon the camels and have taken them away yea and slain the servants with the edge of the sword and i only am escaped alone to tell thee while he was yet speaking there came also another and said thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house and behold there came a great wind from the wilderness and smoke the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and i only am escaped alone to tell thee then job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and he said naked came i out of my mother's womb and naked shall i return thither the lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord so the adversary is foiled and job has not renounced god a second council is held in heaven and the adversary being questioned has to admit job's integrity but proposes a severer test skin for skin yea all that a man hath will he give for his life but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will renounce thee to thy face again leave is given and the adversary smites job with the most hideous and loathsome form of leprosy his kinsfolk as we learn later have already begun to desert and hold aloof from him as a man marked out by god's displeasure but now he passes out from their midst as one unclean from head to foot and seats himself on the ash mound that is upon the melsbeel or heap of refuse which accumulates outside arab villages the dung says professor moulton which is heaped upon the mesbeel of the haran villages is not mixed with straw which in that warm and dry land is not needed for litter and it comes mostly from solid hoofed animals as the flocks and oxen are left overnight in the grazing places it is carried in baskets in a dry state to this place and usually burnt once a month the ashes remain if the village has been inhabited for centuries the mesbeel reaches a height far overtopping it the winter rains reduce it into a compact mass and it becomes by and by a solid hill of earth the mesbeel serves the inhabitants for a watch-tower and in the sultry evenings for a place of concourse because there is a current of air on the height there all day long the children play about it and there the outcast who has been stricken with some loathsome malady and is not allowed to enter the dwellings of men lays himself down begging an alms of the passers-by day by day and by night sheltering himself among the ashes which the heat of the sun has warmed here then sits in his misery the forsaken grandee and here yet another temptation comes to him this time not expressly allowed by the lord much foolish condemnation and i may add some foolish facetiousness has been heaped on job's wife as a matter of fact she is not a wicked woman she has borne her part in the pious and happy family life now taken away she has uttered no word of complaint though all the substance be swallowed up and her children with it but now the sight of her innocent husband thus helpless thus incurably smitten rings through love and anguish and indignation this cry from her dost thou still hold fast thine integrity renounce god and die but job answered soothing her thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh what shall we receive good at the hand of god and shall we not receive evil so the second trial ends and job has sinned not with his lips but now comes the third trial which needs no counsel in heaven to decree it travellers by the mound saw this figure seated there patient uncomplaining an object of awe even to the children who at first mocked him asked this man's history 
and hearing of it smote on their breasts and made a token of it and carried the news into far countries until it reached the ears of job's three friends all great tribesmen like himself eliphaz the temanite bildad the shuhite and zophar the naamathite these three made an appointment together to travel and visit job and when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not they lifted up their voice and wept then they went up and sat down opposite him on the ground but the majesty of suffering is silent here i and sorrow sit here is my throne bid kings come bow to it no not a word and with the grave courtesy of eastern men they too are silent so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights and none spake a word unto him for they saw that his grief was very great the prologue ends the scene is set after seven days of silence the real drama opens six of the drama itself i shall attempt no analysis referring you for this to the two books from which i have already quoted my purpose being merely to persuade you that this surpassing poem can be studied and ought to be studied as literature i shall content myself with turning it so to speak once or twice in my hand and glancing one or two facets at you to begin with then you will not have failed to notice in the setting out of the drama a curious resemblance between job and the prometheus of aeschylus the curtain in both plays lifts on a figure solitary tortured for no reason that seems good to us by a higher will which we are told is god's the chorus of sea nymphs in the opening of the greek play bears no small resemblance in attitude of mind to job's three friends when job at length breaks the intolerable silence with let the day perish wherein i was born and the night which said there is a man-child conceived he uses just such an outburst as prometheus and as he is answered by his friends so the nymphs at once exclaim to prometheus seest thou not that thou hast sinned but at once for any one with a sense of comparative literature is set up a comparison between the persistent west and the persistent east between the fiery energizing rebel and the patient victim of these two both good one will dare everything to release mankind from thrall the other will submit and justify himself mankind too if it may hap by submission at once this difference is seen to give a difference of form to the drama our poem is purely static some critics can detect little individuality in job's three friends to distinguish them for my part i find eliphaz more of a personage than the other two grander in the volume of his mind securer in wisdom as i find zophar rather noticeably a mean-minded greybeard and bildad a man of the stand-no-nonsense kind but to tell the truth i prefer not to search for individuality in these men i prefer to see them as three figures with eyes of stone almost expressionless for in truth they are the conventions all through the orthodox men addressing job the reality and their words come to this thou sufferest therefore must have sinned all suffering is must be a judgment upon sin else god is not righteous they are statuesque as the drama is static the speeches follow one another rising and falling in rise and fall magnificently and deliberately eloquent not a limb is seen to move unless it be when job half rises from the dust in sudden scorn of their conventions no doubt but ye are the people and wisdom shall die with you or again will ye speak unrighteously for god and talk deceitfully for him will ye respect his person will ye contend for god 
yet so great is this man who has not renounced and will not renounce god that still and ever he clamors for more knowledge of him still getting no answer he lifts up his hands and calls the great oath of clearance in effect if i have loved gold over much hated mine enemy refused the stranger my tent truckled to public opinion if my land cry out against me and the furrows thereof weep together if i have eaten the fruits thereof without money or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley with a slow gesture he covers his face the words of job are ended seven they are ended even though at this point when the debate seems to be closed a young aramean arab elihu who has been loitering around and listening to the controversy bursts in and delivers his young red-hot opinions they are violent and at the same time quite raw and priggish job troubles not to answer the others keep a chilling silence but while this young man rants pointing skyward now and again we see we feel it is most wonderfully conveyed as clearly as if indicated by successive stage directions a terrific thunderstorm gathering a thunderstorm with a whirlwind it gathers it is upon them it darkens them with dread until even the words of elihu dry on his lips if a man speak surely he shall be swallowed up it breaks and blasts and confounds them and out of it the lord speaks now of that famous and marvelous speech put by the poet into the mouth of god we may say what may be said of all the speeches put by man into the mouth of god we may say as of the speeches of the archangel in paradise lost that it is argument and argument by its very nature admits of being answered but if to make god talk at all be anthropomorphism here is anthropomorphism at its very best in its effort to reach to god there is a hush the storm clears away and in this hush the voice of the narrator is heard again pronouncing the epilogue job has looked in the face of god and reproached him as a friend reproaches a friend therefore his captivity was turned and his wealth returned to him and he begat sons and daughters and saw his sons sons unto the fourth generation so job died being old and full of years eight structurally a great poem historically a great poem philosophically a great poem so rendered for us in noble english diction as to be worthy in any comparison of diction structure ancestry thought why should we not study it in our english school if only for purpose of comparison i conclude with these words of lord latimer there is nothing comparable with it except the prometheus bound of aeschylus it is eternal illimitable its scope is the relation between god and man it is a vast liberation a great jail delivery of the spirit of man nay rather a great acquittal footnote one it is fair to say that myers cancelled the damascus stanza in his final edition end of part three end of on reading the bible by arthur quiller couch